Um, it's my honor to introduce Professor uh, Juliet Levy, um, who's going to be talking about how not to be a replicant, so it's a useful VR. And I will just hand it off directly to her. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I, it's day two of, of, of what is really an amazing, um, for those of you who weren't here for the whole day, we've been having a great time, but we may also be a little bit tired. Um, so don't take that against me. I mean, I might be a bit slower or, or just confusing because right now I'm having a hard time just managing the tech. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm really grateful to be here and I'm grateful to have been invited because um, it was, I really hope that we get sort of the opportunity to talk about immersive tech and uh, pedagogy in the humanities more often um, and, you know, mixed reality, sort of the, the, the wide uh, array of technologies that that includes. And I mean, and on that note, I, I really hope that you're aware just of how groundbreaking it is to be having this conversation at all, right? I mean, pedagogy in the research university is like somewhere on the lowest rung, you know? It's, I mean, you know, there might, there might be some lip service paid to it, but really it's, it's not a priority. And then technology in the service of pedagogy, that's, that's right there. It's maybe below, it depends on which university you are. So, you know, sort of having a conversation in which we're talking about sort of cutting edge technology in the service of cutting edge pedagogy, which like, um, you know, I just want to acknowledge sort of, you know, respect for, and gratitude for a workshop that is, is all too rare um, and an opportunity that, that's just really, I'm extremely grateful to the organizers. I know you guys have been working really hard at this. Um, so I, I also, and I'm toggling between technologies, yesterday um, I gave a workshop. I don't, I don't think everybody was here, but I mentioned the team that has made it possible for me to do VR as a non-technologist. Um, but I didn't give you their names, and that was an enormous um, oversight, and that's just wrong. And so today I will introduce them by name. Um, Tawny. She is, she's the, the, she's the, the most, she's an amazing human being who spent 20 years at Intel working in their research labs and then, you know, was tired with the corporate side of it. And now is pretty much just really invested in doing VR projects. I mean, she came up with a useful VR concept. Um, and, and she's the one that I talk to and who's capable of executing the ideas that I sort of try to formulate. And Tom Wester is, he is really a visionary in, he do, he's done different forms of immersive media, but he's really particularly interested in sort of the interactive, the, the embodied part of it. And so a lot of his immersive projects have been sort of really used the body as part of uh, the formulation that you see. So one of the latest ones that he's done with Melissa Painter is a yoga and VR experience. But what you're, you're not seeing yourself. There's, it's telling you to do movements in sort of an interesting way. And as you breathe and as you move, and there are all sorts of sort of interesting sensors that aren't on you, so you're very free to move, a tree starts growing out of the ground and the tree starts growing spread. So it's just, it's gorgeous and it's not at all real, right? I mean, like nobody's done yoga that way, but it sort of gives a new dimension to what you could do with your body in VR, which, um, which may be what virtual reality is, right? It's not reality, it's the, it's, this is sort of a, a, a different way. So um, Michael, um, Sonia and Karen and, um, and Alyssa are, have, were the developers that have at different stages have sort of uh, exactly sort of been able to <laughs> understand the ideas and sort of execute them in code. Okay, I feel much better now. All right, so um, remembering to move on. So, um, oh, this is something else. This is, this is Flamingos, by the way. This is Tom uh, gave a class on uh, VR in, in an art school at Portland, at the Portland Art Museum and, uh, no, a school of arts. And you can, if you have an, an iPhone, you can just download Flamingos, um, and it's free. And, and by all means, download it and have the flamingos walk around while I'm talking, because that's <laughs> what it's going to be. Um, the picture I had up here, this is them. They were on my desk last night. I just decided to invite them into the room. And they're, they have sound. And so when they get too close to you, they'll, they'll squawk. <laughs> so you can create a whole flock. Um, and um, it's in many ways, I, I do love the kind of the magical part of VR. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll come out and, and sort of you'll figure it out at, at, by the end of this talk that I am, I'm, I like the part of VR that isn't real. Um, and, and things, the ones that sort of Jaron Lanier noticed when he sort of just looked at his hand in VR and it wasn't a hand, it was sort of these different forms, but they responded to him. And so he had sort of this weird relationship that was wonderful. And I, it's that magic that I just want us to be able to explore more. Um, but, you know, but 
we should ask um, why I'm here, and UCR has a lot to do it, but, but with it, and this is sort of, this is just, well, no, you know what, I'll leave the flamingos up, they're much nicer. Um, why am I here? Um, we haven't uh, met at the MLA or the MLS. Um, I, I'm not a cultural historian, um, and the theories that I work with are economic theories. I, you know, I, I research financial markets in Latin America. I do quantitative history. And some people are looking at me like, oh, you're the dead. <laughs> they know. <laughs> right? So, I can't, you know, why am I here? Why, am, why is an economic historian who's otherwise, you know, we're all known to be boring, uninteresting, and totally on the wrong side uh, of the social sciences here? Well, I, those of you who are here, I, I think I, I, you know, I revealed the mystery yesterday. Um, but I, even economic historians are um, instructors. We teach. Right? And, that's, and I think that's what we all have in common here, right? We uh, are committed, and for one reason or another, to teaching our students and to engaging with them with the technology that is sort of increasingly entering into our, uh, into our worldscape. And so it, you know, teaching is not what my degree trained me in. It's not what my advisor suggested I do. Um, but it turns out that it's something I really enjoy doing. And it's been sort of one of the great discoveries of my sort of post-PhD, and it's been a while now, um, life that I really like doing this, and I like figuring out new ways of solving problems in the classroom. Um, and so I teach, now it's relevant, I teach at a very large public university, and it is a very diverse one. Um, our student body is 41% Hispanic, 33% Asian, 11% white. The faculty is predominantly male and white. Um, I came from an undergraduate institution, and uh, I studied political science in Brussels, where Let's just say that the faculty was predominantly male and white. Um, and then I did a stint in banking, which is <laughs> predominantly male and white. Um, and then I did economic history at UCLA, where the things started to sort of shift a little bit. Um, but to say that my education was traditional is, is really sort of a, an understatement. But before I came to UCR, I taught at a small rural college. My classes were, were small. Um, my students were, it's, it's Virginia, were white. Um, uh, they, were, they were very nice. Um, they knew very little about Latin America, and they were mostly interested in sort of genocide and revolutions in that area. And then a year later, I was at UCR. My class looked very different. Uh, my students were very nice. They knew very little about Latin America. They thought they knew, but they didn't actually. Uh, they were mostly interested in genocide and revolutions. In so, you know, the audience changed. The problems uh, were the same. And so... Um, but what did change was that I had a lot more students. I had a very, very diverse audience, uh, and it was enormous. And so digital platforms and methods is really what saved me from having to sort of uh, kind of lecture to, to endless amounts of faces for hours on end. And it showed me how I could essentially sort of manipulate the architecture of the classroom um, in a way that is, was much more effective than moving tables, which is what we did yesterday, right? So the architecture of the classroom, is, it's a thing, and it matters. And when you have a lot of students, you, there's a limited amount of things you can do in an auditorium where the seats are, are still. Um, I, I, you know, before I start talking about digital platforms, I do want to make sure that you understand that I am I'm not a convert uh, or an apologist for edutech. I'm, um, I generally view educational technology vendors with enormous skepticism. I mean, it's not that I don't think there, then if there are any educational technologists uh, in the room, I, I don't, um, apologies. It's not that I don't think educational technology provides some services that are, you know, totally helpful, but I think there's, it really is about measurement very often and monitoring and, and, and touch points and feedback loops and all sorts of keywords um, that I just don't associate with teaching, right? Teaching is about connection. It's about establishing, uh, uh, really about establishing a connection with each one of those students. And, um, and the, I couldn't do it in a large classroom without technology. Um, and, but, you know, again, educational sort of, uh, Edutech is not digital pedagogy, but, but what the tech can do and what I've embraced it for is really sort of to design a more accessible classroom, a more accessible curriculum um, at a scale that works, right? A, a scale that works um, at UCR, and I, you know, I, I have no means of knowing what I have. So there you go, there's, there's a classroom I thought you know, it would be kind of good for you. This is normal. How many of you work in this kind of an environment? All right, so, I, so essentially, I'm describing a, a, a radically new world to you. Trust me, you will, if, if you taught this, I th you, your relationship to digital platforms, um, 
you know, to teach. And, and when I'm saying digital platform, I'm just going to go out and say it. I teach online very often. Um, it, it just makes things, I mean, it just makes things possible that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So, I mean, I, I know that to a lot of people who don't teach classrooms that look like this, online instruction is anathema. I mean, it's, you know, it's the beginning of the end. I am the enemy. I've been told that by some of my colleagues. Um, you know, I am paving the road to a dystopian future in which we're all replaced by bots. Um, and so I just want to give you slightly different, because everything that I've done, everything I talk about today, I've done in online classrooms and in face-to-face -face classrooms. So it turns out that a classroom is just another platform, right? It's just the one that we're used to. But if you go online, it, it, you can re not just, it's not about recreating, it's about just thinking differently. So, but if you teach 30 students, you know, that's great. You can have a connection with each one. And you teach more than them, and the face-to-face -face experience starts to get diluted. 40 students in that back row is getting really, really deep. Um, 50 students, inaccessible, right? The online classroom, it doesn't have a front row. Like if we were online, it'd be complicated with, I mean, it'd be different, but, um, but I'd see you all. I wouldn't know who's sitting in the back row, and you wouldn't know that you're in the back row either, right? So, I mean, sort of, it's not a monitoring technique, but it is a way to look people in the eye. Um, it doesn't require a particular type of body or body type to access. Um, all my lectures and all the material is captioned, it's transcribed, um, it, there, there's, nobody needs to do anything to have access to it, and the curriculum is entirely transparent, so students know from day one what all the assignments are going to be, they, can, they know when they're going to be due, they have a sense of where they're going. Um, so it, it shifts sort of a large part of the surprise part of like, ooh, pop quiz, and no, you need to come to every class because otherwise you will miss something really important for the final, but it changes the relationship that I have with the students, which is one of responsibility and mutual respect, which is I respect you to follow this, and I will, and you will, how can expect from me that I will get you here? It's, um, and so the, um, the digital classroom also allows you, or allows me, to design a course that relies much more on the students than on me. I'm no longer the only expert in the room. You can structure a series of um, environments in which students become sort of the drivers of the content. There's their guardrails and their series of, of controls, right? Because I'm still the expert in the room and that is what I'm being paid for. But you can trust them to explore a lot more on their own. And so um, since we're, we're not spending time moving around or parking or, or looking for anything, uh, sort of where my bag is or where the bathroom is, which are all sort of important social engagements, but um, um, I, I, what I can do is I can ask students to spend a lot more time doing research. Um, they are, I can ask them to go to the library, the virtual or the physical one. I can ask them to work together on these digital platforms in ways that they are actually quite comfortable doing. Um, and so it's, um, I, it, it becomes a much more interesting space in which to explore how to teach a large group of students. And it be, it sort of returning to the, um, the diversity, I teach a 20th century history class. Um, the canon of the 20th century is Eurocentric. At, you know, I think sort of that's the best thing we can say about it. It's sort of Anglo-Eurocentric. There's sort of a Africa exists, but you know, it, sort of in the 20th century, it only exists after the 60s because there was nothing before. Uh, and then it's like, oh, and then there was decolonization, and students are like, from what? You know, like, none of that is part of. And um, and so I've kind of turned that curriculum into a game. And by game, I don't mean that I'm gamifying it in the sense that it's fun, because it's still a class and there's still grades. But essentially, it's kind of a make your own adventure through it. I, I teach them, I, I explain, you guys need to know what the canon is, if only so that you can engage with it. And so that's one half of the class is, follow me along. Let me tell you what people have decided is the history of the 20th century. And the other half of the class is, okay, now here's some, here's some like in this decade, use this set of documentary sources, but write about whatever you want. Choose a, choose a continent, choose a country, choose a city. And the next week we move on, to, so I've done it chronologically because there's only so many levers you can move with it before people get very confused. But essentially students, the writing assignments are things that students get to choose themselves. They can write about parts of the world that aren't even mentioned in the class, in the textbook, uh, in any other class that they've always been interested in, but that essentially the canon doesn't allow them to do. Um, and so that is something that would really be difficult to do in a large lecture class with 450 students, largely because there are expectations about how those classes work, right? Students arrive, they sit down, they wait for you to give them a lecture, fall asleep, they check Facebook. Then they go to discussion section where the TA tells them everything that was important in the lecture, and they take notes on that. 
Um, and then they start prepping for the midterm, which is going to be in about three weeks, and the TA kind of preps them for the, that exam. And so they focus on what the TA tells them they need to know, and that's what they read. And then we do the same thing for the final, and maybe there's a pop quiz, but there's always extra credit. And so all these, but once you kind of take away those, those restraints of, well, we can only do three assignments because there's 450 students and only so many TAs, and you kind of also, part of what happens in the online classroom is that the TAs have a different way to work, right? Their time is used differently, and so they have a lot more time to engage with students. So anyway, so I'm, I'm a, this is not, a keynote about online teaching, but I realize that I deviated a little bit. Um, I am a proponent of online teaching because I've seen how it shifts. And, and, and essentially, I had to tell you this because this is how I got into the digital platforms, right? The answer to why I'm here is because of online teaching, right? The last 10 years of using digital platforms uh, to teach, that, that sort of, there, there's a leap of sorts, and forgive the pun, it's not a magic leap, um, but it's a real one. And that's, that's why I'm here. Like, I use digital platforms. I, you know, I teach online and then I teach VR. There's sort of a, a nice narrative there. Um, before the, the VR experience I, I spoke about yesterday, which I'll sort of hint at today, I did something else. Um, I, I did a, a project um, that included zombies, and I think that's on this slide. No, oh, this, is, this is what passes for participation, by the way, in, in large classrooms. It's a clicker. I hate them. I've never used them. They're the worst. Um, well, it's largely because it's like the students have to buy them. So it's apart from buying a $300 textbook, they have to buy a stupid $17 clicker. I realize it's, no, I just, I use Twitter. It's, there's better things than, anyway. I didn't sleep enough, so I'm going to have a lot of cider. Um, but so, Digital Zombies is, um, it, remember scale is what matters, right? So, um, Digital Zombies is a game, you could, again, you can go look at it, you can do all sorts of things while I'm talking at it. I'm, I'm perfectly happy for people to be on their computers while, you know, I'm, I'm not a no tech in the classroom person, um, obviously. Um, it was, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a research game, it's a library game that is built into a historical uh, research methods class. Um, it, it, I use it in a face-to-face -face class and in an online class. So it's not just, the class is not just the digital zombies games. There's a bunch of other stuff that's going on. But it essentially is sort of the structure of the assignments for the students. Um, and it's a way for students, it's all built around World War Z and zombies. And, you know, you need to learn this so that you don't become a digital zombie. And, yes, it's, it's you know, it's a catchy concept. Um, but it was, the whole point was to get students to engage with library material uh, both digital and physical, to kind of experience the hierarchy of information. Because I can talk about the hierarchy of information, but it was difficult to get them to experience it. And so in the library, they understood, like, there's, again, the, the physical environment matters, right? There are floors, and there's ways in which it's organized. There are people that explain to you why you're going to find most of the Latin American history books in the stacks under F. But then, you know, when you go to H, it's going to be more economics. And somewhere in between, you might find economic history. Not that I teach that very often, because we're the devil. Um, remember, yes, I'm, I'm the devil twice, online and economic history. Um, but, um, but anyway, so it worked really, it was, a, it was a great way to get a lot of students into the library regularly, right? Not just once for a class, um, but to do something. But, um, it, you know, sort of after we got over ourselves and, oh my God, we developed a game, it's really great. And it's, uh, there was something missing. One of the things that was, we were having a hard time doing was getting students to, like, they were really great at finding sources and they were really great at saying, well, this is a good source for this and um, I found this source for that. But when I asked them to compare, like, between two books, like, why one would be better than the other, well, it's, uh, they're great. They're both great. I was like, no, one is actually not. Can you tell me why? Well, I've, I found them both in the stacks. I mean, they're reliable sources, right? It's like, no, no, they're reliable sources. Just can you tell me why this one's not going to work for the argument that you're making? And so we were, so we were having a, a really hard time. And so remember, so you know, lots of students, there are a lot of TAs, but there's limited amount of time, and we're teaching research methods, not critical thinking. And, there's, and you know, we're trying to get them to understand the library, so there's only so much you can do. And we just didn't have the bandwidth to address the issue of thinking about sort of knowing how to read a book and assess it or a source, right? I forget, I'm talking about books because I'm old and I still think of books, but essentially whatever media they're reading to assess it critically. And so this is where, where the VR comes in, right? So VR is not that new, um, you know, I, I, although I did, hold on. 
Uh, did you, I wonder if this works, so now I'm going to... You guys know what this is? And Yeah. The first VR, but and now I don't have a... There's no... Is there a cursor? Do you guys see a cursor? On which... Am I going in the right... Anyway, if I click... No. All right. Well, if, I, if you click it, it's 30 seconds of the most awesome thing. And what's amazing is that we haven't... It hasn't changed that much. I mean, this contraption didn't move very well and was, like, seriously tethered. Um, but we are... We've, we have come a long enough way from, um, from the, uh, the Sutherland uh, sort of Damocles um, experience that we're in a, in, a, in a time of history where wearable, sort of the, sort of the head-mounted um, contraption is much more accessible. There's a, a, a much bigger variety of, of, of contraptions, right, that are easy to wear compared to this, you know. Um, and there's a lot more to experiment and experience with. The software is easier to, to use, right? You don't have to be an advanced coder to work in Unity. Um, and, and because it's accessible, I think that's how I, well, I, I, I got to experience it. I was talking to Tani, um, who'd left Intel, and she just like, here, I got a bunch of new headsets. Go try this on. Obviously, in VR, it's better. <laughs> Because everything is. So imagine, ooh, lights. Um, you're underwater, and there's sound. There's boo, 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 boo. It's a manta ray. It looks sort of, it doesn't look real at all. Um, but if this is like your first experience, like, oh, you can look above, below. See, there's no, like, normally, you, you, nobody would stand like this, right? You'd be looking to the side, because that's where the whale is coming. It's going to take a while, but more manta rays because they're cool. Anyway, I think we can just fast forward to the whale. Just so that, where's the big whale? There comes the whale. And there's a sound. The sound of the whale is coming through my computer, which is kind of, where? There we go. It is very cool. Pardon? It is very cool. Yeah. Links at you, and then it goes away, and then wait. The, the, this is the part that this is the, this is actually key to the story. So it, it's very close to you, but you know it's it's a humpback whale; it can't hurt you, except the tail. And in VR, this whole thing just goes like this. So you know your your environment moves. Okay, so now, okay, now we go back to the presentation, and I think that there's I, I don't have a single one of these things again, so I'll go over, present one more. There you go, click, and just at the yeah. Wow. And oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right, good. All right. So this is the next part of the conversation, but um, you just look at my some of my favorite uh, works of literary art. But so. <coughs> The, the whale was key, right? So Tiana was just like, here, put it on. And I'm like, it's a two minute experience. I've scuba dived before and in my brain, my memory of that, it's, I remember that experience like, like a very similar experience to any other, I've never uh, scuba dived, I, I've never experienced humpback whales underwater for real, but this one is somewhere in my brain in a very similar place. And the part that I remember, I mean, that I can just, conjure up right away is when the, the whale moves away and the whole wreck moves and, you know, I had to, like, hold on to something, right? Now, was this, a, would this have been a good way to learn how to scuba dive? I don't think so. Probably not, because, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that's missing from the experience that is included in scuba diving, like water and breathing underwater. But it's a really good way to sort of experience the magic of VR. So back to, you know, seeing your hand as a bunch of geometric forms of why the, 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 it's the not real part of VR that, that I, just keeps me there. And so I needed to make that connection with the students. I kept feeling that I wasn't reaching them and we weren't reaching them because we didn't have time, because we already asked them to go hunt for zombies, because there's a bunch of other stuff that they needed to do. I needed them to feel that wreck and to know what to do just instinctively rather than think about what it is they had to do. Um, I, I didn't need them to relate emotionally to the whale, um, but I wanted them to remember what had happened to them there. And so the conversation I started having with Tony is like, is there a way to leverage sort of this VR experience intellectually? Like, is there something we can do 
that would get students to experience something in VR that would mean that the next time they're in the library, they would, they would know immediately what they were supposed to do with the books, right? That they would, they would respond to the, to the incentive, like to the, to the imp impetus, to, to the books, to the space. Um, and, and, and in a way, sort of the conversation led to sort of our first design, first and only uh, design, which is that VR is going to be important and our, our ability to sort of justify why we should do something in VR, right? The why VR is like the first, is always present is what matters about doing something in VR is not what happens in VR, is what happens when you're outside of it, right? So if you're having a great time in the experience, but you can't, we haven't helped you solve a problem differently when you're outside of it, then we, we have failed. Now, I don't say that that's what has to be true for all VR, right? But in this particular case, it needed to be something that fundamentally altered how students operated in a particular space. And so I think we, what we have, and sort of what I presented yesterday, is a prototype that responds to this wish, right? It's not perfect, it's not finished, there's a lot more work to be done, but it is about operationalizing something that's really hard to teach in a large classroom in a lecture, right? How to think critically. Now, we're not alone in trying to do this, right? I think we're in pretty good company. Um, Chris Didi at um, Harvard has been, I think he's spent the last 30 years trying to convince people that it's feasible. Um, and he's now dean uh, or right, you know, some, some administrative level, which would have, I kind of hoped he would have gotten to do more. I mean, it's Harvard, there's more money. But anyway, um, and the king, Jeremy Balenson, has spent a significant amount of time and money sort of exploring how to leverage the cognitive effects of VR. And I think it's really, we think about the cognitive effects of this technology that that's, that's really is what I'm after. And, and there's a plus and a negative side of that. Um, and, but I think the broad adoption of VR and the humanities, right? It's, there's hardware, there's software, there's sort of barriers to entry. But I think the real thing that we need to demonstrate is that, it, that we can do these cognitive effects, that, we can, that they can happen in VR perhaps faster, better, more often than not, right? That these experiences, A, that we can build experiences that can be customized, right? That, that so the template we're working on will fit to different contents, right? So that it's not sort of a, a one experience, one goal per hundred thousand dollars more or, or you know, and I'm being really sort of, I'm lowballing here, um, because I think that's really sort of one of the things that the educational vendors consistently sell is like here you can do whatever you want to and just plug and play. I hate it, but I understand it. Right? If we want people to access it, if we want people to use it, we have to make it easier to enter into the space. Um, and we have to think about what that means um, and how to get people who are generally really kind of worried about technology to engage with it because, because what they care about is the students and students solving certain problems that are increasingly difficult to, te to, to solve in a large classroom. And so this is why we've made some of the decisions we've made in, in, in the VR prototype that, that um, we're building. So for those of you who weren't here, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's, it's a prototype, it, it's sort of lives in the context of Latin American history and students are being asked to sort of make some series of sorting decisions about a text with um, data points that reflect um, other sort of sources, books and surveys. Um, and what we're trying to do is to help that, use that framework um, for other content and also use that framework to get students to sort of get a, a kind of a, a cognitive shift. Um, we're, as I said, we're, I'm not alone, but, but it's still, there's a lot more. I mean, I'm, I really hope to see a lot more people in this space uh, soon. Um, we are at the very beginning of um, sort of what mixed reality in, in education is going to look like. Um, right now, most of the content is being made for entertainment. Um, I mean, VR is not unrelated to film, and so there's, I understand that. Um, but um, what we're also then getting is sort of the traditions of the entertainment industry in VR, right? So in some ways, the entertainment industry is reinventing a way to put the still camera in front of the theater. It is also replicating a lot of the biases in the uh, film and gaming industry. Uh, all the blind spots of the tech world are being replicated in VR. Um, there are a lot of potentially really bad ideas out there 
And it's not that people are intentionally bad. It's just these blind spots, right, are, are kind of hard to convince people to sort of look beyond. And so um, I, ju I just want to be really clear that I'm, 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 a, I'm a loud proponent of engaging with technology, with all of it, even the stuff that I don't like, because I'm really worried that if we don't, we are going to lose the opportunity to sort of engage with the conversation about it, right? If we say, no, nah, this VR is just a fad, I'll just wait until the software and the hardware are easier. I'll wait until somebody can give me something that I can use easily in my classroom. You're going to be at the mercy of whatever educational technology has decided you need to do in VR. Um, and so I, let's not do that. So this is when, where, uh, where the, 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 you know, who, who's familiar with the Sepper-Whorf uh, theory of linguistic relativity? Who saw Arrival? Who read the stories of Arrival? Okay, all right, so Arrival. So we'll just talk about uh, the, the um, the, the aliens arrive and a linguist is invited. There's a linguist and I think he's a physicist together have to solve this, They're like we cannot communicate with them. They have a totally different language. And the linguist figures out how to talk to the aliens. And in learning how to talk to them, she also manages to see their worldview. And they don't have linear time. They have, they see past, present, and future at the same time. And all of a sudden she sees past, present, and future at the same time, right? Language, it turns out, is not just a bridge between cultures, Right, and in sort of in, in Babel 17, it's, it can be used for, you know, it's also a weapon, um, but it's a portal. It's a portal into a different, in a, in, into a worldview. And I worry, right, sort of my, it's, it's, this is not a theory, it doesn't exist, but I could keep thinking about sort of technological relativity, right? That if we don't engage with this technology, if we don't learn how to talk to people who are creating the software for it, if we don't talk to the people who are developing the hardware for it, we're, going to we're not just going to miss the opportunity of sitting at the table to sort of help make some of the content for it, but we're going to miss the opportunity of actually understanding the world that they're creating. And we're going to be at the mercy of it in so many different ways. And, and I just, you know, I don't want to belabor this tomorrow, although please do read everything Te Chang has ever written. It will make your life significantly better. And I, there are at least two people in this room that agree with me, um, or three, and everybody else trusts. Uh, flamingos, great. <laughs> Te Chang, even better. Um, so it just, and, and, and this is probably not the right room to whom I need to tell that we just need to understand technology, right? Because, I mean, I'm just going to use the example of people who don't know what a search, what search engine optimization is, are victims of search engine optimization. Um, it's okay if you don't know what search engine optimization is. No, everybody knows? Okay, we're moving on. Um, if we ignore the technology, we're, it's victims. And so, um, and it just sort of, there's a, I, 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 I keep thinking sort of historical comparisons, right? So when the phones started getting smaller and smaller, at the beginning they were just getting smaller. And we couldn't imagine that the phone could possibly be a computer. I mean, computers were big and phones were big and then, well, computers were getting smaller and phones were getting smaller, but we didn't think they were, I mean, I didn't believe it. Nobody told me that there was gonna, that, I would barely use my phone to call anyone today, right? I don't call anymore because calling is so personal. I use it for all sorts of other things. And so I think like in many ways VR, we're like, this is where we are right now. Remember this thing? Remember, remember the Palm Pilot, right? Nobody used it. I mean, some people used it and they thought it was amazing. And we looked at them like, you're so weird. Why would you want to carry that thing around? Like, why do you want to answer your email on this thing? Um, and so I think VR is sort of the Palm Pilot. We're at the kind of Palm Pilot of the 80s. Um, and and if, you know, if we don't include more women, more people of color, more people that are not in the United States into this technology, it's going to be a nice white uh, Anglo technology that is just not, you know, we're, I don't think so. I think the fact that this room is here is proof that this is not going to happen. And there's some people doing really awesome stuff. And so what follows now is a little bit sort of, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly of VR. It's, uh, I hate industry reviews, but guess what? It's an industry review. Um, and uh, it's a kind of an exploration of what VR offers this a little bit today, what you might see on campus. It's a provocation. I'm probably going to say things that you don't like. You're going to get mad at me and think I'm wrong, and that's great, because then we'll have a, a great conversation. But essentially, this is sort of in service of us not becoming replicants. Um, and this is where the title of the talk sort of comes in. Alex and I had a conversation about the title. It was very difficult for me to. I'm not actually going to talk about Blade Runner, but I do think <laughs> that uh, it is one. Both of them are um, some of the great 
best movies ever, and I will fight anyone on that. It's not the hill I'll die on, but I, will, I, I do think that, you know, if we're thinking about the relationship between human and machines, which this room must do on a regular basis, Turing tests and cellular futures, um, you know, this, this, that movie is great. And, you know, I, sort of thinking about Blade Runner as a f and the fact that the new Blade Runner is just as great as the old one, and, you know, they've sort of incorporated, what is it, 25 years of technological change into it. Um, but the same thing that's happening in VR and film, right? So how do people imagine VR right now? We don't have a Blade Runner yet, like a, a movie that, I think sort of imagines VR in a way that I think is realistic. I mean, and I'm just pulling up like the two latest options, right? Ready Player One, pff, I don't know. It, it doesn't feel like VR to me. It's just, a, it's a game that happens to be tethered in a bit. It's got, you know, Striking Vipers. I know you saw it. Anybody, I, I highly recommend you see it just to see what the worst possible future imagination, like ima pe what people are imagining VR is. Essentially, it's, it's the Black Mirror. It's one of the latest Black Mirror. Um, um, installments. Um, and in this VR, it's like VR is, it's not, it's, it's, there's no lens, it's a chip <laughs> that you stick to your brain. And honestly, it's like LSD. I mean, not that I've ever done LSD, but I think that's what LSD would be like, which is you take a pill or you stick it on your brain and then you just go somewhere else and experience really wild things. Um, and so it's like, I don't think people, you know, we can talk about VR, but I think most of the people in VR, I mean, I, like outside of this room, I don't think people think about VR. And so that is another problem, right? Because if you don't know back to, if you can't even imagine, and if the media isn't providing you with an, a, an image of VR that is, um, well, that's kind of realistic, then, then, then you know, it, it kind of it pushes people away from it. So there, I, again, there we go. That's, that's, that's the, uh, it's just visuals. Um, so now, I, I, you know, so let's, Think about what we might be seeing, right? So there's the media that's giving us images that are, eh, and, um, and the things that you might actually see. So I think one of the things that we're already seeing is a new form of narrative. Like VR is really shifting. It's, it's allowing us to think differently about what narrative means, right? It, it's shifting the single author perspective. Um, it is making it possible to put works like Alice in Wonderland, Frankenstein in VR. Um, I mean, I'm just talking about the two that I'd like to see. Um, um, but essentially, there's nothing, it's subverting the authorial voice is something that VR is really, really good at, right? I mean, all of a sudden, there's not one frame, there's a multiple frames. And if you're going to make a movie in VR, you're going to have to think about a lot of options for your viewer while still allowing them. So you need to put guardrails and have a ton of options. So again, this sounds sort of like classes I teach, but it's, sort of, it's essentially about trusting the viewer but directing them. And there's a lot of really interesting work that's gonna be made in that. Um, historical events in VR, you're gonna see a lot of that. I think many of you are already working on that. But you know, the Cuban Revolution VR, the San Francisco World Fair in VR, um, scientific labs in VR. Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody's seen, if this is a Scottish VR company that did the lunar landing. So the Apollo 11, it's sort of the takeoff and it's just, it's fantastic. It's passive, but it's amazing. You know, you, you're sitting in a 1960s living room and there's JFK giving a speech and then you turn the light off and you move and all of a sudden you're one of the, you're the, you're, you're the right stuff. You're gonna, you're walking there on the plank, you sit down, you don't actually sit down. So there's, it's always not quite real, but you have the whole experience of sort of leaving earth and going to the moon. Um, and you know, like that, we're going to have sort of, uh, and you already see a lot of really interesting AR museum exhibits, sort of ways in which sort of immersive technology is making the experience of engaging with art and with literature and with history um, in a different way. Um, I think VR, and one of the things that it's really great at is allowing humans to go where humans normally can't go. And it's not just about going to the moon or going underwater, but you can tiny, tiny, and become a blood cell and go through. A body and you know look at the inside of a heart as opposed to the outside of a heart right um, it's, you can fly you can go to space um, you can perform all sorts of uh, engineering feats or just learn about engineering so it's really hard to teach engineering uh, in 2d and so there's some really interesting classes are being taught in VR to teach sort of how the internal functioning of complicated engines works because you can actually go inside and look at those things. Um, and that gets me to sort of simulations in VR, right? So the, the, the simulated 
teaching that's happening in VR, that really is sort of that, the, the, the connection. That, there's nothing that new about it, but it's really, really interesting. So medical training, um, pilots, everything, it's, it's, it's getting better every time. Going beyond the realm of physics, sort of, again, VR allows you to shift your perspective on things. And once you shift your perspective, you can make new findings. And so um, like space exploration, adding soundscapes. Um, there's a group at UCR that is using soundscapes as adding soundscapes to sort of a VR exploration of, of deep space that makes it more accessible to non-sighted individuals. Uh, it, it is unbelievable because everything we think about VR is about seeing it. And there, the, the, the sighted part is almost irrelevant because you know in space it's, it's kind of dark. <laughs> a, so it turns out that soundscapes are a much better way to experience space than seeing it. I mean, in reality, right? If you're not in, in a sort of in a, in a movie context. And soundscapes are, are, are sort of, I think it's beyond VR, but in the sort of in the immersive realm, are, is, there's some really interesting stuff. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, is Jessica Brillhart. Um, has a it's a it's it's an app, but it's not really an app because it functions in a specific context. Um, it's called Tra Traverse, and essentially you can kind of pull up um, Elvis right now, and it, he's sort of like in a hologram. But it's not just you're not just seeing him; you're also hearing him. And as you move, you move away from him, and the sound gets further away. Uh, and she's done um, kind of collaborations with I think the London Symphony, which is sort of combining sort of holds the planets, I think, with something on the planet. And it's, so it's, it's, again, closer to what Tom Wester does with kind of movement and sound and having kind of that kind of immersive. So VR is really just one of the many implements in which really amazing things are going to happen. Um, smell and taste are coming, just so you know. Um, I think I have a this is, um, there we go, feel real sensory. It's, um, it's a thing. I'm not entirely sure it should happen. Uh, you know, back to, yeah. I mean, will it make your environment more real? Sure. Do you want to smell London <laughs> in the 16th century? No. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about porn in VR, but. That is a part of the entertainment industry that is doing a lot of work, and don't Google it. <laughs> but as ever, um, people are going to find all sorts of ways to entertain themselves in an immersive environment, and who am I to judge? Um, now, I do want to say about some things that really shouldn't. And again, it's, this might not surprise you, but there's some things that will happen, and we need to be aware of them, the fact that they're going to happen. And when they happen, we need to be we need to know how to respond to this. Um, there's going to be a lot of historical recreation of VR. And it's, it's already happening, and it's innocent, and it's interesting. It's you know, reconstructions of destroyed buildings, reenactment of certain people giving speeches, right? JFK on TV, right? But that wasn't, the, it wasn't really JFK. It was JFK on TV. But you know, very soon we'll have JFK in a, Elvis in a hologram. Um, or the, uh, anybody seen the Vikings show on the History Channel? Right, awesome, right? I mean, people get super excited about the Vikings <laughs> because it's Vikings, real Vikings. Um, I mean, so much better than the show, right? Because you'll be there, you can look around, it's like you're there. Um, and uh, you'll be able to experience something that you've only been able to read about. I mean, that's, that's, I mean as, a, as a historian who teaches history and wants students to engage with it, my God, like finally, like here's the, here's the thing, I got to grab them by the, you know, by the guts and they'll love it. I need to remind you of the cognitive load of a VR experience. VR does not get experienced the way you read a text. VR gets experienced at a very different emotional level, right? Even if I keep focusing sort of on what the technology, like the intellectual levers are, there is no control and, very, and there will be increasingly little barriers uh, over who gets to create historical content and historical reconstructions, what is going to be included in those historical reconstructions, and what's going to be omitted. And once VR history is out there and, and mobile VR is going to put it in everybody's pocket and software advances make it really easy to upload any version of history, someone's going to experience a historical event that didn't happen. And they're going to remember it as if it did. And it can be used for good. We can do some really cool things. But I think the bad, in this case, outweighs the good. And that, that stuff just scares me. I really, that, I, I mean, I'm honest. I mean, that is, 
you know, I am profoundly troubled by the fact that there are all sorts of outlets that are going to use this extremely emotional connection, right? This, this ability to, and we are, we are all, I mean, if students will believe, or not students, but my mom will believe something because it's on Facebook, right? It's on the Facebook. What happens when this, you know, when a 16-year-old kid sees a historical reconstruction of, I mean, just honestly, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you, I, you can all imagine the worst possible. Um, and there are a lot of, pers for, uh, you know, possible awful things. Like, on the one hand, VR can help us sort of bring voices back into the historical record, right? The soundscapes make it possible to do things that text might not. But God, you know, this is, we, technology has gotten too good at creating alternate versions and fake versions of things. And again, back to that cognitive load of VR, right? There's, there's no distance, right? An untrained person in VR, I mean, even, I, you know, I consider myself to now have done enough VR, I still remember that whale as if I'd been underwater, right? It's really hard for me to, to separate those two things. Um, and so, you know, whose alternate history is gonna get told? Um, I mean, I, so this is my big warning sign. This is the thing, and, and again, this is why we need to be part of the conversation, right? So that when people say, oh my God, why don't we make, you know, Civil war, let's do uh, civil war battles in VR. Sure, let's do some civil war battles in VR because I mean, that's what reenactment, like what is it, 90% of reenactment is about civil war battles. Fine, you know, you wanna wear stinky clothes and fight a battle. I mean, but at least we all know there's people in cars watching them. It's nobody, you know, it's very clear that this is a reenactment in a wor real world. Once it becomes a VR experience um, and that's all the civil war is, to the reenactors or to the people experiencing it, then, um, you know, anyway. It's a bad idea, but it's in our future. That's, it's coming. So, again, I, I really, listen, uh, VR is not a time machine. It is an empathy machine, but it's also a horror machine. And I think, um, it, it, you know, we need to know that if we can conjure up positive feelings in VR and, and lovely smells, we can also conjure up really negative feelings and, and, and disgusting stuff. And, I, I, and anybody see the Carne y Arena, the, um, um, the Iñárritu exhibit on sort of a VR exhibit of immigrants crossing the border, which he'd created, um, essentially took it to uh, Washington, D.C. I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge exhibit. You're, you're, you get the goggle, you've got sensors, you have to you, you, you have a backpack and you're walking through sand and it all sort of recreates the awful experience of being an immigrant crossing uh, the, the, the desert. And you know, the intention was to generate empathy amongst congressmen and women in DC. First of all, that is not the experience of an immigrant crossing the desert, right? That is a recreation and you know, it's six minutes and yes, it's impactful, but then you take your backpack off and your goggles off and you drink a glass of water. I mean, it's, it is not that. Um, and so I think it, you know, VR is a really powerful communication tool um, but all powerful communication tools can be used to m different uh, ends. And ultimately, I think what, what matters in VR is not that it's real, is that it's, it's not real, right? The, po the powerful lever that we get to move is not in trying to recreate reality or a version of reality. It's in sort of really kind of exploiting the part of VR that isn't real, but that is still relatable, that can generate magic and curiosity and thought in humans that I mean, it's, it's a place of embodied learning and we should just maximize, optimize, just do the most we, with it we can. We can, we, can, we can immerse people emotionally in many different ways. And, and, and I'm just gonna just remind you, like the cognitive load of VR is the, is the reason why we need to be really careful what type of reality we create in there. Um, and, and sort of we're better off sticking to the, the not entirely real. And I think, you know, um, we can make people experience things that they'll remember as if they'd thought about them as opposed to as if they'd felt them. And I think that's, that's the promise of, of useful VR. And um, I mean, I think the road is still long. We're at the beginning, right, Palm Pilot? It's gonna be bumpy, it's gonna be really fun. I look forward to it. And um, I thought I'd add a puppy at the end of this, <laughs> but I didn't, because I've just, you know, but I felt like after sort of drawing up the, like the worst parts of VR, I kind of needed to lighten the, but you've got flamingos, so just pull up a flamingo <laughs> and remember what's great about VR because it's the flamingos. It's all about the flamingo. That's what I should have had at the end. Flamingo. There we go. Thank you.
I, I did not look at time. I have no idea whether I went over or under or spoke my usual way too fast. Um, I haven't, but I want to tell you that since we've been talking about your project, I've been thinking about it, and I, I was sort of actually last night thinking that what you're doing and what you sort of realized, and again, I don't want to, I'm not going to talk about your project, but sort of the, the, when you've realized what happens to, what, the, what matters to students in the exercise, right, with the interpretive part is, like, that's such a great example. So this is, I might just blow it. <laughs> Jessica's doing some really cool things in VR. But I think the coolest thing is she's getting students to make a series of decisions about how and what goes into VR. Right? So it's not so much the VR experience, which is very beautiful, but it's the making, uh, so it's, back, it's, it's sort of it's the, the, the makerspace part of VR that is really, really interesting. And I think that, you know, like pulling a lot, that, I mean, you've, you know, I, 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 I've been, <laughs> I'll be gone, and you can talk, talk shit about me all afternoon. Um, but it's, it is, but no, but you still, you have to go, because you need to see how to do, like, I can say it, but again, it's not the same as doing it. But I think it's, it's um, and this goes sort of more general beyond VR, it's like people don't think about what goes into the media they consume, right, which gets us to search engine optimization and why the Facebook is, you know, cool. It's like, the, people don't think about how constructed our entire digital world is they understand it in the physical world in the analog like yeah so these are decisions that are made but the, the digital is just there like it just poof arrived um, and you know in a way it's flat it's on a screen it's hard to detect hierarchies right and so I think it's so part of my kind of one of the fights I continue to have the reason why you know digital literacy has to be more than what you know the the the, the tech vendors say it is like here you know teach your students how to write you know how to find the right file naming nomenclature very important but essentially it's how what we see in the digital comes to be is the important part and I think um, I think VR is going to be a really interesting place to make that even more physical because or visible because it's not 2D right it's not on a flat screen it's going to be much more like it's more like real things so yeah so yes and I'm sorry but it, I love what you're doing. I, and I completely agree with you. Yes, we have, we have to engage with this technology and start creating... Content. Yes, yes. Um, but, I, but I'm also thinking about the other ways to engage with it uh, and to be um, a voice of saying, you know, this is not real or this is not good. And, and how... What are some strategies for doing that? And I, you know, I'm thinking, of, I'm just thinking about like, oh my gosh, the, you know, the library, all these books, all these texts, all this knowledge, and and you know, citing that and bringing it up. But who's going to listen yeah. to that? And and yeah. what, you know, what what options do we have for making those critiques that will be in a way that will be heard? Right. I mean, how often do academics get heard? That's a good, and, and nobody reads I mean, citations. I think we're the only ones that care about citations. Um, but I, th you know, I'm not going to go dark. I mean, I think, I think having this kind of a venue, this kind of a forum, more academics talking about it, being willing to engage with technology, despite the fact that we're not in a computer science department, actually sort of, you know, bring in computer scientists into the conversation, right? I mean, I think the next stage is having this kind of a, a conversation with the computer science department with the faculty that are teaching students how to do stuff in Unity, that they're all going to go work for, you know, whatever the latest game 
development company is and make you know four times more than I ever will. Like, they're not taught to think about these things. They're not told that this is important, and it isn't, right? What's important is for them to know how to make things in VR and make it fast and make it cool and make it look great. It's not their fault, right? I mean, but I think these conversations need to be sort of the same way that, that, that medical schools now have kind of medical ethics as part of the conversation. I think, I think kind of thinking about digital ethics has got to become part of the conversation. And, and, and you know, you can't, I, I don't think that this is something that needs to be imposed, but I think that there's a desire to talk about the consequences of some of the things that they're doing, right? And, and you know, a lot of the, you know, I don't know to what degree it's they're sincere, but sort of the, the realization by some of the Silicon billionaires, like, oh my God, what did I do? Um, you know, leverage that. Like have them talk, they'll listen to them, right? They won't listen to me, because I'm just a historian and an economic historian at that. But, um, but essentially just having more of the conversation, just keep, keep be obnoxious. I'm good at that. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, I operate in a small academic environment, but I think we just can, you know, having more platforms on it, like, you know, like not, not just talking to ourselves, but sort of having sort of Twitter reaching out to people. Um, I, 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 you know, we, I think as academics, we're not, we're not really good about PR. Like we don't think PR, and, and I don't talk about PR as like in terms of like making sure people know how great we are, obviously. Um, but, but really about making what we do intelligible beyond academia. And I think this is precisely the kind of thing that does lend itself to that. Right? But if we, if we don't convey that, if we're not reaching beyond it, then if we, and, and I think if we worry, I mean, there's sort of the pressure in academia to publish, right? And no one's gonna care if we publish in something that isn't peer reviewed. But we have to find a way to generate a conversation that goes beyond academia. And you know, sort of I think the Twitter is a great place to start that, but I mean, again, the, the circles are, are, they're getting bigger, but they need to be concentric and sort of the, the ripples. Yeah. Just so thinking about, like, could you elaborate a little more on how you see this working sort of for the future, especially for junior faculty? So I've gotten a lot of pushback as a junior faculty member against working in like, games and doing things that are fun and being on social, which I'm actually not on social media. Um, I'm actually off and clean and sober off of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter from 2009. Thank you. Wow. Um, even though I'm on the social media committee. But anyway. So, <laughs> but there's this idea, though, if, and I have a good colleague, uh, Kara Cooney, who's at UCLA. She wrote a popular book for her tenure review, and she got a lot of flack for it. Yep. Not from higher administration, who loved it, because she went on all the TV shows yep. and lots of, you know, lots of uh, interest. Yep. But her colleagues, right? Yep. Um, and colleagues still to admit Snyder Marsh, even though she's brilliant and has proven herself in so many other well-cited articles. Yep. So how do early scholars sort of confront those academic challenges, and how do you, especially maybe people of color, women, whatever, set yourself up to be respected in this area that has so much, that's so challenging to be respected in, and to not be dismissed as somebody who just is popular on Twitter or somebody who doesn't do real research. Can you speak to some of that tension? Uh, right, so we thought the worst thing we were confronting was sort of awful historical reconstructions in VR, right? This is, this is the real... This is the real, yeah, you, we're just, we're just going to be dark. Just, it's, um, I, it's hard. I, I'm aware that, so um, flying under the radar, I find, is, I realize it's, that's not the answer you want, but it helps, right? Do, do your thing. Just don't tell the people. Here's the thing, you can be on Twitter, your colleagues won't know, because guess what, they're not on Twitter. So there's sort of that, right? So, and I think it's, you, you kind of develop multiple personalities, right? There's the, the, the inside your department personality where there's a huge part of it that is performative and it's awful. But I know that I couldn't do anything to it until I was tenured and even as a tenured woman, it's, oh man, that, that cadre of senior sort of full professors are, it's, it's like, you know, sort of undoing really invested structures of power is really, really difficult. Um, but I think like if, you know, again, going rogue, staying under the radar is not a bad strategy because, you know, you can do a lot of stuff in social media, again, they won't know. Um, I think another way of using technology um, is to reframe it, right? So, you're, de you're not developing a game. 
you've got a very immersive syllabus. Um, yeah, you use technology, but it's not technology. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, they use, they have film, you have film too. Same thing. Um, I think the gaming has, all, like, the using games, um, yes, they, you know, I mean, academics are frightfully, are, are just afraid of losing the, I mean, the one thing I think academia has for s some of our colleagues is the fact that it's serious, right? They, this is serious stuff. It is not superfluous. It is not superficial. Unlike everything else in the world, what we do is serious work. If you do anything that sounds somewhat fun, you're calling all of that into question. And so, yeah, I, I go, fly under the radar until you get tenure. Is this being filmed? Oh. <laughs> Can we not put that in, please? Well, I've thought a lot about this. Yeah. It's a workaround, right? It's being peer reviewed, it's in a journal, you've got senior people doing the you know heavy lifting for you, and it gives everyone credit where credit is due. Uh, but I think Juliet is right that sometimes being under the radar is also a good strategy, and surprisingly, most of those crotchety senior people don't even know what social media is <laughs> and have no real clue of what's going on. And sometimes you can have a fabulous intellectual life and none of your colleagues know about it because they don't care to know about it they're not <laughs> part of that sort of digital world. So I think there are multiple strategies. So I, think you can I love that one by the way, which I think that's it's I mean maybe that's something I can come out of this. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. If I may uh, add a little bit to, to that book uh, the problem with flying under the radar I mean, I don't know what your circumstances are, but if you say, okay, I'm going to do all games, and then none of this is, none of this is valued, that's valued at your institution, I mean, that you're still going to have to have the record of scholarship, you know, to, um, to, to, to stand up for, for tenure, right? So it's like double the workload, which then goes into the, the sort of vicious cycle of uh, uh, you know, junior faculty doing twice the work and getting half the recognition. <laughs> so, so that, that's a problem, even yeah. though I, I do agree with you. I mean, I've, I'm guilty as charged. I did fly under the radar, but you don't sleep a lot, you know, just so you know. <laughs> um, I will also say that there is light at the end of the tunnel, because we've been talking about this for about 20 years now. And so a lot of the people who were in your shoes uh, when uh, 20 years ago are now right here. <laughs> uh, and they are starting to be in positions in either department or in the profession. Um, where this type of work will get recognized, right? Uh, when your sub goes out for tenure uh, in, in a little bit, uh, you, you will find senior colleagues that are well-respected scholars, um, well-respected teachers to comment, you know, external letters on, on your dossier, and uh, it will look a whole lot better to your own institution. So it's not completely dark. <laughs> <laughs> But it requires strategy, so but that's, it, it yeah. Require, I mean, it does require a, a coaching plan, for sure. Yeah. I had a question about games. Yep. Um, you talked a little bit about gaming and how it's sort of connected with immersive tech, but obviously it doesn't have to be. And, um, I, you know, I don't come from background working with games, but I'm increasingly around people who are doing games, and I'm interested in how I could use them. And the thinking from this kind of workshops focus on the colonial theory most games are pretty cool, like imperial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, get resources, get power, win, kill everyone else. <laughs> um, like most games are still kind of like that. And so I'm just kind of wondering to hear you talk about you know, how you think games could be useful, gaming mechanics could be useful in immersive tech and just more generally for critical thinking. Yeah. 
so, um, so I think, yes, some, so the games that you can buy online, uh, the games that are successful, um, well, I mean, every game involves, there's, there's, there's some rules, and you either win or you lose, right? But, not, but there's also something that, what makes a game fun is not the fact that you win or lose, it's the fact that you're engaged in, in the game mechanic. And, and so there's, so that's where Uncle and I met, is that, I mean, I, by the way, Andy says hello. I was, I was emailing him yesterday. Um, so the, the digital zombies game, no, like, you, everybody wins. There are games in which everybody wins. There are games in which there is nothing to win, like the Monument Valley um, thing. There's, like, you know, there's things that you need to solve, but there's no losing or winning it. Um, but you're engaged in it. And so if you kind of reframe your understanding of games, not as something that you either win or lose, but, but, but a, a, a kind of, a, 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 a kind of a, an architecture, a, a structure in which there are things to solve that are in and of themselves fun to do or purposeful, then you can start. Getting, so the, the 20th century history survey is, is a game. I mean, and I, I don't have a, but essentially the, the explanation to the class looks like a board game, right? There's like you go through places and you have to take choices and you, you know, pick something here. It's got, I mean, the only way you lose if you, if you don't play. But otherwise, you will pass because the, as you're doing this, you'll, and so I think um, we need to think about games not as, as in this kind of capitalist context, but more in a, um, I mean, if you read, and I, I'm happy to share sort of game, games and educational games literature on the, on the, on the shared workshop uh, um, drive, because it's, it's a really interesting way in which, again, back to sort of subverting the role of the expert, like sort of there's a theme here, right? So VR subverts the role of the author. Games really subvert the role of the expert. And the expert creates the game, but we're nowhere to be seen. Students are playing on their own. They're exploring things, they're making decisions. There's clear rules about what the outcome of some of their um, actions are gonna be. Um, and so I think if we kind of, if you, if you think about a game, not as, as something that has sort of a final winning or losing, but as a series of engaging processes. And this, I think that's also helpful for those who do gaming uh, in academia, and not in sort of computer science departments and who have to kind of justify what they're doing to their, um, to their colleagues is it is just a very innovative way of structuring assignments. So that's one way of, you know, and, and again, I, I'm happy to sh share anything about it, but it is, it is one of the, it is a really interesting thing when you decide that you're not going to be in the, and I, you know, and I really am like this in front of the classroom, right? I mean, like, but when you take yourself away from the podium, right, and you hand over the tools of the class to the students, and you have to find a structure in which it's not chaos and anarchy, that's a game. That's essentially, that's the game. And I, I can't think of anything, I mean, that's a, it's, it, it is the beginning of sort of, like, really, like, undoing the colonial structure of academia. It's just, just rip the faculty off the front of the room, just out. We're going to have a lot more great discussion throughout the rest of the day, but we are now um, almost through the entire time of our original coffee break. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 because we've had a great discussion and we've kept it long, but why don't we continue this conversation at the coffee break? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.